Uh, thank you very much for having me here. Thank you, uh, Trulia, for uh, giving us this venue. Uh, yeah, so my name is Vadim. Uh, I've been uh, in, into like data and visualization for the past seven years. I counted it up on the way here. Uh, it all started when I kind of ran into uh, the visualization working group at Stanford, uh, and they were working on Protovis and D3, uh, and then I kind of just got sucked into that world, and then uh, joined some startups that worked on some cool big data, you know, scalability challenges. And um, uh, I had a talk that I developed about some tools uh, that I built before, and then I was presenting uh, that and uh, you know uh, when I was asked to do this meetup I was thinking okay awesome let's do a meetup uh, let's like uh, tart up that talk a little bit and it's gonna be beautiful and then I, I wasn't feeling inspired by it so I, I wrote a brand new talk uh, to encompass more I, I thought why not I have an hour anyway uh, so I wanted to talk about the general idea of OLAP for uh, big data and the challenges you face along the, the stack to do it. Uh, so first of all, uh, what is OLAP? Like, uh, it's, it's, a, it's a term you hear thrown, a lot, thrown around a lot, uh, probably especially in San Francisco, you hear it on the streets while you're waiting to get a sandwich. Um, and uh, I, was, I don't like it because it's kind of like, a, it sounds like an acronym or a disease, but um, I decided like, there's no like after searching high and wide, there's no better word to describe it. Um, OLAP is an analytic way. It's a way to get visibility into data. Uh, basically, you have some data set uh, full of data points. You define some dimensions, uh, whether you know they're actual dimensions in the, the columns in the table or some virtualized concept of a dimension, and then you use uh, filter splits and aggregations to, to learn more about the data set. Basically, uh, like if you ever heard the term like slicing and dicing, it's about OLAP. Um, and the key point of OLAP, like the thing that you must have for it to be like a worthwhile experience is that you must be able to quickly and freely switch between arbitrary dimensions. So you just say, okay, like I have some data set, I wanna be like, okay, well, uh, by country, what is my breakdown of this or that? Um, and that's very important, both the quickly and the arbitrarily. As in, uh, you don't want to have any dimensions that are sort of set in stone that you can only look on those. And you want this to be like an interactive process. So uh, I hope many of you have used OLAP techniques before. Uh, if you haven't, then you might have used it, but not known you have. Uh, SQL uh, is a great tool and something that you, you do OLAP in. So it, basically, if you are familiar with SQL, OLAP is the subset of SQL composed of select group by queries. Uh, anything that you can express as a select group by query is an OLAP query, provided that you can get the data fast enough. So maybe you had a database and you wanted to like ask some questions about it, so you kind of boot up your a console and you start issuing some SQL queries. Um, dplyr is a really awesome tool uh, that I'll get back to later. I, I, I'm sure uh, the people who haven't used the SQL, they use this part. Uh, it's, it's a tool in R. It's kind of like the tool in R. Um, and it's all about uh, OLAP exploration. Uh, so basically you do you filter, you uh, aggregate, and you compute things, and this is very effective. Uh, and then you have something like pandas in Python, uh, which is, again, you have this, uh, you know, you group by something. Uh, so in this case, this is a, a, a notebook in Juniper. Uh, and this is really cool as well. Like, uh, Python is a really great language to, to do exploration, and notebooks is a really cool concept to show your work. Uh, so if you've ever done like, uh, if you ever played with pandas, you've probably been playing with OLAP under the hood. Uh, maybe you didn't even know that you were doing. And then finally, you have uh, full, fully featured UI tools. Uh, here's a, a screenshot of Tableau uh, that uh, I took. Uh, and Tableau is basically, it aims to be an OLAP solution. So in here, 
you have uh, you know, the, the things you're, you're splitting your data by and the things you are aggregating. You have some, uh, some filters in the little filter control. And uh, really at any point, uh, you should be able to drag a dimension from here uh, onto the visualization and kind of get it visualized. Um, but what I wanted to talk to you about is that like, OLAP is a really, really great way of approaching data. And really, the core of this talk is that big data can break OLAP. Like, there's a lot of OLAP techniques that um, you might be thinking you're using OLAP, or you might be using actual OLAP tools that run on top of like, uh, like when when it's a small data set, you it is you're genuinely doing OLAP. But when you move up to big data, you face new challenges. Uh, so, for example. Um, if you have some sort of a, a data store where the queries take a while to return, that will har hamper your interactivity. And OLAP is really built around the concept of asking a question, getting a response back, like uh, looking at this, looking at that. Uh, there's this a synonym for OLAP is spinning the cube. And you want to kind of, if you, if you imagine having a, a cube in your hand, or like a physical cube, you just kind of look at it from all sides. Uh, you, you're doing this in real time. You're actually like interacting with it. It's changing as soon as you, as you move it. And that's something that if you, if you there's certain data stores that uh, can handle like any amount of data, but then if you query them, uh, they'll give you the query back in minutes or hours. And that doesn't really uh, matter because it will lose your attention and will lose your train of thought. Um, so samples distort the data. Uh, other, other things that you could do is you could extract some data out of, out of your big data store, uh, but that limits exploration. So you could always take big data uh, and turn it into small data by making like a filter, uh, just taking a tiny amount of it. So for example, if you have like sales uh, or like transactions across the entire year, uh, well, maybe you look at the transactions for the past uh, hour, and you could analyze that easily because that's not that big. Um, and uh, th th those things are limiting. Like they don't free you up to do the full range of exploration. And if you sample the data instead, maybe you say, "I'll take every tenth data point." Uh, you could reach conclusions that aren't like accurate. Um, in certain cases, that would be completely unacceptable. Um, and then there are certain queries that you might be used to making, like in your SQL or in your uh, pandas or just. Certain ways you might be interacting with data that stop making sense, and this is kind of like the second part of my talk. Um, and finally, if you're using a, some sort of a GUI that's not aware of these, uh, way, like how to query big data and how to be a good big data citizen, uh, you might be in for a subpar experience. Um, so uh, I thought I would talk about uh, this stack right here. Now, full disclosure, this is the, actually the stuff that I work on. And uh, these are all open source tools that kind of try to solve the problem of big data on OLAP. Uh, I know these tools really well. I kind of only know these tools really well. Uh, so, uh, or at least like every line of code well. So I can, uh, so I can talk about uh, individual techniques and how they manifest themselves in those tools. And then sort of the exercise for you, for the reader, is uh, to go to Pick your favorite tool and see uh, how what it does there. So uh, the stack, and this is all open source, by the way. So uh, this is easier for me to talk about because I can point to specific things in the code. Um, the stack is three things: uh, Druid, uh, a real-time OLAP data store that was developed specifically for the OLAP use case. Uh, this was developed at uh, the company I worked at previously. So. I, Sorry, if, in case I haven't mentioned this already, uh, I now like co-founded the company that is around that, the, around these tools and kind of offering support for them, uh, for you know, but also building the open source tools as well. Uh, so then there's Plywood, which is the query layer that I wrote, and that talk that that was here that I was giving before was really about plywood and about how queries are made. And I'll, I'll go into that, but I wanted to paint it in a broader context. And finally, there's a pivot, a, a, an exploration UI that is built on top of plywood for the Druid data store. And it, everything is 
uh, meant to work together and kind of solve all the, like do all the right things at every step to, to facilitate an, an all-up experience. Um, so I'll start by talking about Druid, or the data store in general. Um, well, so what does an all-up data store need? Like what, do you, what requirements do you need to, to have your, your store considered like fit for all-up? If you imagine like putting a stamp of like fit for all-up uh, at every, uh, fit, fit for big data all-up at every step of the way. Uh, well, first of all, you, has to, you have to be able to support arbitrary filtering, splitting, and aggregation. You have to be able to define any filter, uh, any dimension split, and then any aggregation. Uh, because you don't know what you're going to be interested in when you're doing OLAP, and the whole point of OLAP is that you don't have to know. You have a dialogue with your data to discover what it is. Um, so this rules out a lot of data stores that do uh, heavy pre-computation and rely on that for their speed because it limits your flexibility and even if you can define uh, ahead of time like okay uh, maybe I want to you know be able to uh, segment on these like three dimensions uh, that might not be good enough. Uh, next well it has to be quick the, there's just no two ways about it you have to be able to answer queries in less than a second ideally so that second isn't it's kind of an arbitrary number uh, sort of just throw it around. Uh, it comes from a very unscientific estimate of how long it takes for a person to lose their attention span. So the idea is that if something, if you're like interacting with a data store and you're asking it questions and the, and the responses take 30 seconds to come back to you, uh, you're gonna actually forget what you asked and maybe you even get a coffee or check Reddit um, and uh, could completely lose your train of thought there. Uh, and uh, so you need to be able to handle uh, huge amounts of data. Uh, well, if we're talking big data, let's, let's, let's say petabytes. Uh, obviously, uh, you might have smaller requirements, but then this wouldn't be big data, would it? Um, and finally, uh, a lot of data like, lives in streams these days. Like everybody who, who has like, some sort of a system that really is important, uh, usually collects data as a stream and then like puts it in Kafka. I mean, you, saw, you heard the, uh, the Trulia uh, recruiter before me, he was interested in people who know how to, how to use Kafka. Kafka is very popular because streams are really popular. And if you have big data issues, you probably have a stream as well. Um, so this is like why Druid, how, like how Druid solves these things. And now I wanna go into like the specifics of how these things are kind of implemented inside. Uh, so first of all, Druid is column oriented, uh, which means you can scan a, c a column really, really fast. It's essentially just a, an array of numbers or, or strings bundled up together. Uh, you can also compress columns really well because they, um, well, usually they have the same kind of data inside of them. Um, uh, Druid has automatic rollup, which I'll talk about. Uh, I think it's an interesting feature, but uh, it's a really uh, like cool way to reduce your data size and increase your data speed. Um, so you have to have good indexes. Every database lets you define indexes, uh, and Druid uses bit bitmap indexes, and um, this is really to support these, the arbitrary filtering use case. Uh, I'll give an example of how a bitmap index works. Um, then you have special algorithms. Uh, so basically, if you have a distributed system and you have, um, like, which means that the data lives across many different machines, uh, there are certain operations in math that are commutative and associative, like uh, addition. So you can add data on all of the system, all of the machines individually, and then you can bring it all together in pairs and add them up and add them up, and at the end you have your total event count or your total revenue. That's a very easy computation to do. Uh, but there's a, lot of, uh, there's a lot of computations that don't fall into that category that are really cool. Uh, for example, uh, something that everybody always cares about is how many unique users came to my site or uh, how, much, like, uh, how many unique people or how many users that came to my site yesterday came to my site uh, tomorrow. Uh, the kind of set operations. And if you think about it, 
uh, you need to compute those kind of operations, you need to bring data that is stored across many different computers and aggregated. And this data, these operations aren't associative uh, or commutative. So if you had basically a million visitors on your site uh, last week, and then a million visitors on your site this week, uh, well, how many a million unique visitors did you have in total over the two weeks? It's not two million, because probably somebody came back. Um, it's hard to compute. Uh, luckily, there's actually a bunch of cool algorithms that came out uh, that uh, support these kind of, they, they basically the way they work is that they're approximate uh, and they give you some error, but in exchange they make these operations commutative. So you can actually aggregate it in this, like uh, you can map, up the, map out the work to a bunch of machines and then reduce it at the end. Uh, so uh, Druid supports an algorithm called hyperloglog -log, and there's uh, theta sketches, which are for like set intersections. Um, these aren't um, specific to Druid. These are actually open source libraries on, in their own right, but uh, they are um, really cool. Um, and then finally, just you, Druid can stream from a, like a Kafka feed. So you can just connect to a stream and it's kind of the easiest way to get data into Druid. So, uh, Actually, if you like load a file in, you'll be streaming it in, pretending it's a real-time stream, even though it's just a file. Um, so let's talk about rollup. Uh, rollup is kind of a trick that you can do on any database. Uh, it's something that you can do on Druid. Uh, well, Druid does it for you, so you don't have to like do it explicitly. And then Druid has a bunch of stuff around just managing it. But the basic idea is very simple and something that can be applied to any data store. Um, like even a small data data store, you could, you could increase your speed. Uh, because what Rollup basically does is it flat out decreases the amount of data you store. It doesn't compress it, it actually uh, just reduces the number of rows that you have in your data. Uh, and the way it's done is that if you have, let's say I have some sales figures of my uh, auto dealership. And uh, you see maybe this is a Japanese car emporium uh, where I'm selling Honda and Toyota. And then I have, this is like a secondhand uh, uh, shop, I guess. And I have like a time when I sold the following makes and models of cars, as well as the year of the car and the sales price and the sales fee. Uh, I completely made up this data set. Don't read too much into it. Um, but uh, what I can do is I can actually find, uh, say, okay, well, I can pick a, a number of dimensions and then find everything that, that is exactly the same in, the, in those dimensions that matches up exactly. So for example, this a Honda Civic uh, appears three times. And you know, it's actually, there's a different time to each one of these transactions. But if I was to truncate this time to a day, so transform it to just the day part, uh, then these three rows would be identical. And then I can compute uh, the following aggregates as a, uh, like as a little mini uh, reduction. So this row basically tells me now that it's representing three Honda Civics their total sales price was the sum of uh, this number and this number and this number. And their total sales fee was the sum of the according fees. And then I can also compute the minimum sale fee. I, can, uh, I need to, to take care to compute like, uh, for example, I couldn't, once I perform this operation, I, I can no longer get the maximum sales fee out because I didn't explicitly compute it as a column and I cannot do a max, maximum on, on, on this column, for example. But I can for, uh, for compute average. And as long as I know ahead of time like uh, what columns, what like dimensions I'm interested in, essentially saying, you know, uh, maybe I'm interested in everything, or maybe like I want to cut these things out just a, a, before I put it through the system, uh, you can get a tremendous speed up. Now, this obviously varies from data set to data set. Uh, for some data, it doesn't make sense at all. Maybe uh, your data has some sort of a unique identifying information in it that w means it will never roll up with anything else. But um, a, a place where a lot of data tends to emerge is in any kind of auction system or market. And whenever you have a market and you have bids, or you often have like many bids for the same thing. You have bids uh, that kind of 
all roll up together nicely. Um, so, so this is anywhere from uh, interesting and uh, harmless to a huge money saver. Uh, and then the next uh, part that makes Druid quick and like is a trick that sort of any database can use uh, and some, some databases do, it's just kind of like a technique that's particularly good for arbitrary filters, is uh, bitmap indexes. So uh, when Druid indexes some data, it, it maintains a bitmap of um, where in the column that thing appears. So for example, model, uh, model equals Toyota uh, appears not here, not here, here, and here, which is represented by 0011. Uh, and then similarly, a bitmap can be computed on the fly for a Boolean predicate. So for example, year uh, less than 2011, uh, well, it's this one, this one, not this one, this one. Uh, and you compute that. Uh, the really cool thing here is that you can do and operations, uh, or operations, any kind of operation you want by just uh, doing a, a Boolean, um, uh, a Boolean operation on top of these bitmaps. And if you uh, put this together with something like the uh, concise compression strategy, which uh, allows you to do Boolean operations on things without actually decompressing them, you can get a really, really fast system. And the, the cool thing about this is that the more filters you add, the deeper you dig into your data, the faster your queries become. Because uh, Druid will do this step first before reading any data at all. Uh, or uh, bitmap indexes will allow you to do this step first without reading any data at all. And then you just select and like, look at only the data you need without scanning any unnecessary columns. Um, so that is why Druid is really, really fast. Uh, now let's look at plywood. Uh, so what is Plywood? Uh, Plywood is a query layer that makes it easy to issue big data friendly queries. Uh, it's basically like any application that you um, build on top of data uh, will probably have some sort of a query layer because at the very basic level, uh, data stores don't have like, you know, your application probably isn't going to be talking directly to the data store right there and then like with no level of abstraction between them. And something needs to plan out the queries and understand what kind of actual uh, strategy like you will do to, to get this data. Especially if your application can make queries where like a single like logical query in your application will translate to many queries in the data store. Uh, Plywood is open source and it's kind of like also developed as a little standalone, th standalone thing. Uh, which is why my previous talk was on it. Uh, I was just talking about kind of the approach of how, how Plywood thinks about data and why that's cool. Uh, but the basic idea is that uh, you have your application. It has, like Plywood provides the modal part of MVC, modal view controller, that allows you to define your, like, you know, filter predicates and uh, dimensions and measures, and then it, you, can, you can tell Plywood, OK, I want this kind of query. Construct it using Plywood. Plywood sends it over to the data store and retrieves it, um, optimizing the queries as you go. Uh, the idea here is that really uh, Plywood's API makes it very easy to make data queries that are big data friendly. And I, uh, I want to get into what that is all about. Um, but first, I want to just explain uh, an, a concept that kind of underpins Plywood and uh, that is the logical thread underneath it. Uh, it's the idea of split apply combine, uh, which was popularized by Hadley Wickham, who wrote that uh, um, dplyr tool I showed off earlier. And uh, uh, ply, Plywood, dplyr, it was very uh, much inspired by that tool. Except, uh, I guess, sorry, if, in case this wasn't obvious, uh, Plywood is actually written in JavaScript because it's ma made to power web applications. Um, so uh, essentially, the idea of split apply combine is, you know, it's the, the quintessential idea of OLAP. It's how you, it's the basic operations, the, the atomic matter that make up an, any OLAP query. Uh, you start, you can imagine your data set as like, you know, a, a bunch of colorful points uh, inside of a bucket. Uh, you filter by just, you know, removing some points. 
Uh, and then you split by defining a dimension. You say, okay, you know what? I want to split by country, and uh, now I have like you know many different buckets that, that, that define the different countries. Uh, then you can apply to each one of these buckets. You could say, okay, I'm going to count up the edits. I'm going to count out the number of added whatever whatever it is. Like if that makes sense, uh, this is like the aggregate step, and then. And then you do a combine. You say, OK, I want to do a limit, uh, and I want to sort by something. Well, you sort first, then you do a limit. And that step is very, very important. Limits are very important in general. Uh, and a lot of the times, uh, you, it's very easy to sort of forget about them, especially if you're, using, uh, if you're not running on top of uh, a big data store. But uh, with big data, you also get high cardinality dimensions. Uh, so in this case, uh, I'm looking at um, uh, a, a feed of GitHub events. And I'll actually uh, talk about this more later. Uh, but uh, this is looking at the languages that are being, like, this is looking by language, uh, what kind of languages are being, like, you know, contributed to GitHub, uh, and how many additions they all get. This is a very simple query to make. This is kind of the natural way you would uh, you would make uh, this query if you were just doing some all up. The, the thing that you have to remember, though, is that there's a ton of languages. Uh, in fact, there's something about programmers that makes them really into making up new ones uh, with funny names. Uh, so if you did that query, you'd get a whole spew of things back. If you wanted that query to finish quickly, uh, you'd do well to, to add a limit to it. And to add a limit, you also need to define what you care about. And if you're building a UI, you better make your UI issue your query with a limit uh, unless you know for a fact that that dimension is um, not very big. For example, maybe like a, 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 a Boolean dimension. Um, so let's see how this blows up. Well, this is a, adding a limit here was a, it was a solution to this. this is, there's no, no question. But then sometimes people say, well, I want to see the interaction between two different dimensions. I want to see language and organization to understand which languages are used by which organizations and kind of get insight into that. Uh, and I could run this query. You know, I'm running it over a week of data here. And I'm saying, OK, uh, this is what's called a multi-dimensional group by, where you define several group by clauses. Uh, and you know, uh, especially if you have two dimensions that are high cardinality. If you multiply them, uh, you get a really, really high cardinality thing coming back at you. So potentially, this could be huge. If you, have, if you run an auction house and you, you know, do this kind of query between like, every seller and every buyer, uh, you're, not, you're gonna wait for a long time to, to have this query come back to you, regardless of which uh, database or data store you use. Um, so very easy. Let's, let's do that same limit trick. Let's add uh, some thing we care about, uh, like some ordering, and, and let's do uh, a limit on that. Uh, well, that's actually not great. That's not going to produce what we want. Or it might produce what, we, what you want in a very particular case, but it's not producing what I want here. Um, the reason is the, the kind of response you get from this is, uh, you basically get all the language organization pairs that have a lot of additions. So, if, so I actually ran this query. This is on actual data. These are 100% accurate numbers. The, the biggest language organization pair for that time period uh, was Python as the language and Web Archive Group as the organization. They added what, uh, what looks like six million, seven million almost uh, lines of code. Uh, the thing is, this is, this is kind of useless, because this is just giving you top, top pairs in that thing. If you wanted to uh, have a more thorough analysis of that, you'd maybe look at which organizations are using the most, like, uh, what prolific organizations and what languages do they use, or what languages, or um, for these languages that are popular, which organizations use them. Uh, and this is uh, kind of the idea of uh, smart limits. I, I'm still kind of 
trying to figure out a good concept for this. But imagine you have this question, what organizations are the top contributors to the top languages? Uh, well, you see, uh, so this is a, a, like a hypothetical query. Well, it's not really hypothetical. This is a, a query you can execute with plywood, uh, but it's not something that would work in MySQL. Uh, but the idea here is that uh, you group by language to get the top 10 languages first. And then as one of the aggregations, uh, you actually group on organization within it. And the result you get is this nested data structure where you know, the top language is JavaScript. This is true. I'm not biased because I program in JavaScript. It's just that in GitHub, the most popular language is always JavaScript by a wide margin. Um, and then within JavaScript, you get uh, the, like the following um, uh, organizations that are really contributing to it. HRR 13 Cobra, uh, Learn Co Students. And then Python will have completely different organizations. And the reason that these queries produce such drastically different results is because uh, fundamentally, like one organization codes in one set of languages and another organization usually codes in another set of languages. So these are very like disjoint dimensions. And this is true very often. Like, if you look at the kind of products sold in Starbucks and the kind of products sold in Burger King, there's very little overlap between them. Uh, so if you just looked at, you know, if you did the same thing for like product sales, you'd get like Starbucks, Latte, Burger King, Whopper, just an ordering of things that exist and are popular, as opposed to some sort of a meaningful grouping of them. Uh, the other advantage of something like this is that um, like with smart limits, you, it comes this concept of like infinite scroll. Uh, you really want to have a limit on any query that you do, but you do also want to give people the perception that the data is just like there and unlimited and just keeps being loaded. Uh, and if you do it like this, if you imagine like rendering this visualization and then scrolling, oh, wow, the scroll is so quick. Uh, and then and scrolling uh, all the way to uh, all the way down. I don't have uh, dynamically loaded slides, thankfully. Um, uh, then then you can imagine actually just having to modify the limit and skip clause of this top level query, and then all, like within each one of them loading the second level. It gives you a lot more control if you're building an actual UI. Um, and um, so lastly, so this is plywood. And uh, I, I, lastly, I want to talk about Pivot, which is actually a UI that uses it and sort of dive into uh, the details inside of it that uh, I feel like we're specifically designed to be big data friendly. Um, and uh, before I kind of dive into it, I just wanted to say, like, the basic rules, I tried to distill this, is that um, you never, the like, first rule of uh, first rule of big data, never issue unlimited queries. You know, the caveat to this, obviously, if you know that, you know, if, if your dimension is gender and you only have 15 genders in your database, uh, then please go ahead, uh, issue that query. But uh, in general, unlimited queries on like, let's say, user-defined dimension are never a safe thing to do. Uh, because, you know, a single query uh, to your database that's trying to load all the data will uh, maybe crash your database. Um, next, you never just want to you know, load all the data and do something with it. You want to load the data incrementally and then mask the fact that it's not all there by doing clever UI tricks. Uh, this requires more work for the UI developer, but uh, uh, hopefully uh, with better tools uh, it becomes easier. Um, and then you want to be able to rapidly sw switch dimensional focus. Uh, this is more of a some th something you don't want to give up. Uh, you don't want to build a, like a UI and, the, uh, and basically the compromise to making it work is that you can't switch from one dimension to another uh, really quickly. Uh, because it will just produce, well, I mean, m maybe if you're, I, I, I don't know, like it won't be like a true big data all up supporting UI. Uh, and lastly, you want to enable a ton of contextual exploration. Uh, the bigger your data becomes, the more different values all dimensions have. This is, it sounds kind of silly, but 
it's true. Uh, as you filter into one thing, uh, you end up discovering like other things in other dimensions. And you want to really uh, kind of push on the contextual exploration bit because uh, this isn't really something that you, you know, must have to get an all app stamp, but it's something that you should strive for if you're building a, uh, a data UI. Um, so uh, I want to put it all together and kind of show you uh, how uh, Pivot works and kind of highlight some things in it as I, as I uh, show, show the demo uh, and also do some exploration maybe uh, c together. Because I really enjoy, uh, like I think all up done well uh, is really fun and really fun to actually like play around with. I think uh, Tableau makes like a lot of exploration like quite, quite fun. Uh, and I think I, we're, you know, Pivot tries to achieve the same. Uh, so uh, this is Pivot, I just loaded it. This is actually looking at a GitHub data set. So this is looking at the GitHub edits um, for the past, what, like 24 hours, let's do one week. Um, and uh, this is running on top, of, so just so you understand, um, this is running that stack I was showing before. Um, everything that you see here uh, is open source from start to finish, uh, and uh, you, you could set this up yourself uh, and uh, play around with it. It's ingesting data in real time from, from Kafka by, from like a scraper that scrapes the GitHub public API. So this is only public API, Not your private events aren't going to be indexed here. Um, and then uh, it's built, like this is Pivot running, built on top of uh, plywood and uh, allowing me to have access to it. Uh, this data is uh, really fresh, uh, less than a minute ago, which is just our catch-all for like right right now. Uh, so an event that happened in GitHub like a minute ago uh, should already be seen here. So I'm gonna play around with it. So uh, the idea here is that um, you know, as I was saying with OLAP, you have your dimensions and you can really drag a dimension and then say, okay, now I'm looking at uh, data by this, by this dimension right here. Uh, and maybe you can zoom into the past uh, uh, three, uh, three days to refine your filter. Um, and then uh, on the side you have the like, spin board for contextual exploration. The, the whole point of it is, come on, load quicker. Uh, Oh man, if this works slowly in the demo, this will be super embarrassing. Um, let's load a few more dimensions. Okay, this shouldn't load so quickly, so slowly. This should be like instantaneous. I don't know why, uh, why that took so long. But uh, as you can see, these are the different uh, languages that are being like committed to GitHub. And as I said to you before, JavaScript always at the top by a pretty significant margin, and then Java and Python always jostle for second place. Or say, I say always, I mean like in the past year. Um, so let's look at uh, like let's look at language. Let's also look at uh, the type of event. So GitHub has many types of events. I hope you guys all use GitHub. It's a really great service. Uh, and uh, so uh, one type of event, uh, one type of event is. Uh, an issue comment event, so I can like filter just onto that, and then uh, sadly, issue comment events don't have any language attributes assigned because you comment on an issue, not on a language of any kind. Uh, but let's see, uh, let's let's look at like these uh, issue comment events. Uh, well, maybe no. Uh, let's look instead at um, uh, let's look at a, an interesting repository. So, uh, oh man. I'm gonna murder our ops team. Um, so yeah, as I said, it's really important for queries to come back in less than a second. Because if they come back in, any more than a second, you get really agitated and annoyed. And um, I hope you can see how annoyed I'm getting at the fact that these queries are not coming back as quickly as I hope. Um, but uh, let's see, uh, so right here I can, uh, uh, 
search for J Druid. And then, uh, so, so this is an important feature of like the big data-ness of this. Uh, everything that it loads is sorted by something. So right here, this is sorted by count, and uh, you, you can change that. But these are, these are sorted and limited. Here, this is a search. It's sorted and limited as well. And this is a great way to get around the fact that you can't really load that whole dimension in, because you, it might be really big. And then you can allow people to uh, search. And then as you search, you can actually uh, see um, how, like, you could first reduce the results that you already have and then like load more results. So this is contributions to Druid in the past uh, three days. And then I can uh, split this out by, um, uh, let's see, by the user and see who's actually working on it. Uh, so this is uh, uh, Fangen, it's actually my co-founder. Uh, and then let's, uh, let's also split this out by time so we can see how people are working on it over time. Uh, and this is, like, th this is the kind of speed that you, you, you want your OLAP to have, really, really fast. So like, any kind of, uh, you know, so you can look at, um, okay, so let's say like, you can look at it by user, and then you can say, okay, well, let's look at it by the type of event for each user. And you see now it's like picking up pace. Now this is like correct speed. Uh, so uh, you, you can see for each person, for example, like this is this type of a nested analysis with nested limits. Uh, you can see for each person the kind of events they're doing. So FJY is making mostly issue comment events while, while uh, uh, GNM is making pull request review comment events. So reviewing pull requests. And then uh, if we pull this out to uh, the past 30 days, uh, again, that, that data load speed is adequate right there. Uh, you can see that, you, you can basically see which people are like commenters and which people are, um, uh, you know, uh, actually like making pull requests and doing stuff like that. And, you know, GitHub has APIs for this. Like you can actually like go on somebody's page and see what kind of events they're doing. But <laughs> this is actually a great tool for like looking at a candidate. Uh, and talking of that, maybe can I get a volunteer for somebody uh, that I can search on and we can look at their activity and joke, make jokes? <laughs> I'll, I'll, do my, I'll, I'll do myself. Um, and something is up with the user dimension. I don't know what's up. No, wait. Before it was hanging on organization. Well, this is, this is the, th the part I won't touch on this talk, is that if you're running a, uh, a big data system like this, it's very important to have monitoring. And I'm sure I will log into my monitoring and discover why everything query errored. I bet I killed something. Oh my god, I bet I killed something. I bet my UI that's meant to never kill anything killed the database. Um, let's switch to another data source. Let's end the demo all together. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, so uh, uh, I, I guess the, 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 the last part of the demo is left as an exercise to the reader. Uh, and uh, I think I might have just crashed something. Uh, we did just do a new release, which we probably shouldn't have done right before uh, I came here and deployed the latest code to our cluster. But uh, yeah, um, that uh, I wanted to show off a bit looking at uh, like an individual person's uh, query, like query, like behavior on GitHub, and, and look into that. Uh, but I guess uh, since this is uh, the end, I'll go to my next slide, which is uh, you know this is what the kind of stuff we're building at Imply, and if you want to make sure that. A demo never goes down again in front of a <laughs> uh, of a, a meetup. Uh, please, we need we need your help. Uh, so uh, yeah, any uh, questions? Yes. Normally, the data warehouse is quite how to say that is to most of these the top of the data warehouse is the real time and also the calculate the aggregate. So a lot of data. Hope at the during the night time, a lot of data warehouse actually build and do the queue. Do you build the queue during the night time or during the 
Because I don't see you build a game. You, everything is just for your data and then go to the people table. Uh, so uh, can you just elaborate what you mean by build a queue? Because build is just the pre, pre allocate all the aggregate. So then you, you, you build all your dimension and then you build your uh, aggregate and then build your calculation. Oh, yeah. Uh, uh, so, so in Pivot, the, 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 the cube is defined ahead of time. Uh, and it auto like in, in inspects like your schema and uh, like the, the dimensions you added uh, because the data is like always changing. If you add a new dimension to your uh, if if you're ingesting data from Kafka for example and a new dimension appears, it will automatically be added and it will automatically surface in Pivot. If you wanted to add some sort of a derived dimension or a transformation, uh, you could go in and, and do that. Uh, in the configuration uh, for Pivot. But, uh, and what we want to do is add an ability to uh, add a dimension right there and then. Like, like you know, if it's, a, for example, some sort of a transformation of an existing dimension. Uh, and uh, yeah, but that, that's like a, a future, future plan thing. But the, the answer is yes, you define the cube ahead of time. Uh, so you, you had a question, sir? Hesitant to ask, but what are the clever UI tricks for sort of getting people's attention spans uh, maintained if there's a little bit of a latency? Uh, well, you refer to that when I was like, yeah. I, I, maybe a bad taste, but. No, no. so uh, the loader is very important uh, because if you don't have a loader, uh, you know, it's very easy, like in a test production environment. This is something I do all too often uh, in a test environment to build a UI with no loading state and then realize that you've done that mistake after like it's out the door. Uh, well, hopefully not actually out the door, but after you show it to somebody. And, you know, showing it to somebody is a really great way to test it because it will guarantee to work the slowest at that point. <laughs> uh, then, uh, and then the other thing is, uh, a lot of the time, like in many operations, there's a certain operation you can already do uh, on the existing data that you've loaded so far. So uh, on the on a search in uh, in Pivot, you could like when when you type in, if you add letters to the end of your search, uh, it actually just filters the data that you already have loaded, because if you like are adding letters, you're increasing the strength of the filter and decrease like the it means that the set of that filter will be necessarily a subset of of what you have uh, and uh, so th those kind of tricks and then another trick is uh, it, always being conscious of what is actually shown on screen and loading that first and then having another query to to fill the the, the rest of what's not shown on screen so in that table uh, that I was showing, like only the stuff that's shown on screen was actually loaded at that point, which is part of the reason why it can uh, do these things very, very fast. Uh, if you uh, expand it to a, a bigger, it, it also means it would work on a slower connection, because if you, even if you could like do this big like multi-dimensional cross product and just load all of that data in, uh, just transferring that over to the client side will take like a while. To, to do if you were inclined to do that. Uh, so really, just being very, very conscious about what data you load. Do you set, for the user, do you set expectation? Like, is there any way to sort of set their expectation about what they're going to do? Because they may think like every search is going to be the same, and depending on what they're doing, it's not necessarily. Any way to help kind of anticipate uh, the, or, or do any? Well, uh, a, a trick I've seen used before, and I don't know how I feel about it, is yeah. to, to, uh, to, to have a, uh, like a non-interactive slow mode that, like, where instead of everything being snappy, you kind of like configure all, it's, like a, it, it's always good to have fallbacks in UI. So like, uh, well, I guess if your database goes down, you don't have a fallback. <laughs> but uh, if you can do something where, like, Usually you have this cool fast way, but if that completely fails, there's some fallback you can go into. So a good fallback to like, this isn't interactive enough is, okay, it's called the slow mode. Like you 
configure everything, and as soon as you make any kind of change where it would have loaded a new query, it just puts a big, all right, compute now button in the center, and waits for you to click it. And then maybe has like a like, little loader. Uh, and then uh, switch to that automatically if, for example, the, the user is meeting some criteria, usually around how much like, time they're viewing. Um, it, it, because uh, Pivot is more oriented around streaming data, uh, and drew it the same, the time filter is always required. Now you could kind of set your time filter to be like the past 1,000 years, but uh, it's at least asking you to be conscious of what it is. Because most of the time, you wanna see the past week or the past day of your data. Uh, and if your UI is like that, and then the user switches to the past uh, three weeks of data, uh, or the past like three months, you can uh, then trigger slow mode. Another way to, sorry, just to, to build on top of that, uh, one of the cool uh, features of Druid is the ability to define um, different tiers of hardware but by time. So you could have like your last week of data live on super fast, really quick hardware that's really awesome. And then anything like a month previous is running on the cheapest hardware you could manage because you know your SLA said to your customers that this data must be accessible, but you never promised them how fast. Uh, and uh, in that case, when if if your UI is aware when that sw switch off happens, and if it knows that you're querying data outside of the the hot region, uh, it can then automatically switch into that slow mode and set the right expectations. Uh, but it's very hard, I think, in general, to write, to make a UI that's meant to be fast, but still like, works well n when it's not fast. Because if, if people have seen it be fast, they expect it to be fast always, god damn it. Yeah. Yeah. You are talking about the bitmap. So, do you, so you, you need to, in order to do the bitmap, you need to, to convert your data to the, to the bit format. So you need to have a lookup table in order to, to do the translation. Yeah. So how you how you maintain this look this lookup table? Because your data is changing every day, and then how you how you define your new uh, yeah. column or data to the to the bitmap? Uh, yeah, so, so the question is, uh, how do the bitmap indexes get created, and uh, especially when new data can be added? Uh, the, the answer is, uh, basically, uh, in Druid, all, everything is, um, th there's a concept of a segment size that's usually, an, like an hour is very typical, and uh, every hour you grab the data and you look at all the columns that you saw, and then you, it creates a, a bitmap index for each one of them. Uh, the real-time component, before like the hour is complete, uh, doesn't have a bitmap index. But it, it, it has a lot of resources allocated to just one hour of data, and as a result, it can serve it quickly. Uh, after that hour is over, plus like, uh, some time after that, you take this data and you compact it, you build the indexes, and then you hand it off to the historical nodes that uh, are much more efficient because the, the data is in such a, an efficient format. Um, and uh, the, the, tri the trick, there is no trick to it. You just build a bitmap index for every dimension you see. And uh, you can go in and be like, oh, like specifically ignore these dimensions. Don't build indexes for them. But by default, if you just have a new dimension show up, it will build a bitmap index for it. Question? Yes? Yeah, uh, I don't know much about Druid, but is Pivot server or is it running in Druid? Yeah. Uh, Druid is a, is a cluster. It has, uh, like guarantee, guarantees about high availability and like the, the biggest cluster I think I know of is around 500 nodes. Okay, so if, do you have any idea how it compares to like a different stack like maybe we, we go to Cascade, we have Spark either streaming or just like a different Spark and then Spark SQL, maybe Zeppelin? Uh, yeah, yeah. So I think uh, like, so the question is about the comparison of like the stack I presented and like a Spark, Spark SQL, uh, Spark streaming stack. Uh, I think the, like, the answer there is that um, uh, basically Druid is really, uh, Spark is something that's designed well for uh, kind of running models and 
uh, switching like what model you want, training artificial intelligences and stuff like that. Uh, Druid is more designed for specific OLAP, like slice and dice. Uh, Druid is faster at these things, but there's a lot of use cases that Spark would support that Druid doesn't. Um, the, like, there are people, and this is actually kind of very popular in the community, to actually integrate uh, Spark and Druid together and let Druid uh, handle any kind of slice and dice load and then Spark handle any kind of more of a long running job load uh, that uh, you, you might have. And um, so, the, the, so in, the, in that kind of stack, people take Spark and Spark SQL and they actually connect Druid as a, uh, as a, a DDR or uh, as a, a data frame within Spark that Spark can map requests onto. Uh, the reason they go through the trouble of setting up Druid is for the things that Druid can do well, it can do it about uh, orders of magnitude better. But for things it can't do, then you have Spark. Cool. Well, thank you so much.